Awesome. Come on, everybody, let's open up to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. I'm going to read this. This is out of the New Living Translation. It says, For you know that you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you. We never accepted food from anyone without paying for it. We worked hard day and night so that we could not be a burden to any of you. We certainly had the right to ask you to feed us, but we wanted to give you an example to follow. Even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work, underline that word work today, those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Yet we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's businesses. How many of you know that an idle life leads to gossip? An idle life doesn't lead to anything good. We command such people to urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and work to earn their living. As for the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing good. Come on, Hill City, never get tired of doing good. I'm going to talk about a subject that probably everyone is going to have mixed emotions about today. It's the subject of work. We're going to lay a theological foundation for the word work today. Bet you've never heard of a sermon like this one. So come on, let's pray as we get into this today. God, thank you so much for blessing the work of our hands. God, thank you as we open up the word of God today, uh, Lord, that you make your word known to us, that you reveal to us the areas that we need to work on. God, thank you in Jesus' name that you just give me the words to say, the words to speak into people's lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't you say amen right where you are? Uh, you know, this theological term, work, I, I, I want to start by asking you the question, what do you think about when I say the word work? What comes to your mind immediately? For some of you, the, the thought of going back to work is a, is a sense of dread, while for others, the thought of going back to work is kind of a sense of excitement for you. It's a sense of relief. Uh, Nora had a surgery this past week and we were talking with the, the nurses and we just, I just asked, is it nice to get back to work? And the nurse looked at me and she said, thank God we're back to work. This is so nice to get back to work. But I talked to other people and they're like, man, I'll tell you what, we had a really, really nice time on this little break that we had. They weren't necessarily economically impacted uh, and really got a lot of family time. And as we inch back into work, as we inch back to opening up the economy, uh, I actually wanted to, I had this on my heart for, for weeks, to talk and lay a theology of work. So what comes to mind when I say this word work? Okay, what comes to mind when I say that word? Uh, I went to Geneva College, and going to Geneva is a Reformed Presbyterian school, and I was blessed to learn uh, how to study the Bible from a Reformed perspective. I really love it. Now, I obviously fall under the more charismatic side of theology, but I really bring alongside it with me this amazing Reformed uh, background of, of study and exegesis. And man, I love it. I love digging into the scriptures really deep. But one of the terms that I learned when I first got there, remember Pastor Zach was just a Catholic boy, just doing the very best that he could, was this idea or this argument of grace or works. I had never really understood grace or works. Now this is actually, when we talk about work, this is actually one of the most profound theological arguments that there is. This is one of the most foundational theological arguments that there is. And the question is simply, is a man saved by grace alone or by works alone? Now, let me give you a little bit of church history. This is so cool. I'm a, I'm a student of church history. I love it. Helps us to understand where God's going in the future, to understand what he's done in the past, right? So in 1517, there was a man named Martin Luther who was actually a theologian, and he was studying under the Catholic, uh, the, under the Catholic studies. Now, in that day, we have to understand that the church you know, began to, to meet the Council of Nicaea, met about 325. Come on, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get real geeky with you. Is that okay? Can we get nerdy for a second? Just bear with me. Let me give you some historical context to uh, to the to the word of God, if that's okay. But the Council of Nicaea was this council that came together it, it, and essentially churches started in homes in the beginning of of the movement of God. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he gave power on the men to go and to spread the gospel. So the, the, the situations that we saw within the church were that wealthy people had larger homes and they would host gatherings within their homes. Inside those homes, there would be a teaching elder and there would be a bishop that would oversee all the teaching elders and there would be a pastor that oversaw all of those bishops in all the different areas. Uh, as, as, as the church began to expand, there began to get... Uh, Man, this is going to be really interesting. Do I got any, any extra ex-Catholics out there or any Catholics who are like kind of sneaking on here and wondering? Now, I'm just going to give you church history, okay? This is interesting. But, you know, the, the Romans were great organizers. 
They're really great organizers. Militarily, they had like all the organization skills in the world and they really leaned into that. So we really begin to see the focus of Christianity taking place in Rome. Uh, the Orthodox didn't necessarily like that. You know, they were in the Western part and the Eastern part. And so there were churches all over the place but it seemed like there was a huge emphasis on the church in Rome. And the Council of Nicaea, 325, gathered and says, what, it said, what do we believe? And this is where we came up with the Nicene Creed that many of you know. I would really uh, suggest you to Google that Nicene Creed. And it's, it's very good, even to this day. It's a creed that we stand by at Hill City, right? So we have the Nicene Creed in 325 that pops up. Am I getting too geeky for you? You still with me? Come on, this is good. So then we see that... People did not have the Bible for about a thousand years. Isn't that crazy? Can you, can you imagine going to church each week but not really having a Bible? You would have to be dependent on what other people taught in the Bible. And this is why many different doctrines began to creep into the church. Okay, Professor Zach is still here with you. But a lot of, a lot of these doctrines started to treat, you know, sink into the church, but people didn't necessarily have the Bible to back it off of and look into, right? So as uh, 1517 comes, comes along, a man named Martin Luther has this thought of like, wow, I'm reading the Bible and I'm seeing all these different things in the Bible and we're doing all of these different things. Like, what is this? And so he tacked the 95 Theses up against the door of uh, the, the All Saints Church in Germany where he was a seminary student. Uh, maybe he was a professor. That's what he was. I'm sorry. But he, he attacked the 95 Theses. And, and what took place after this is there was an awakening in the church. There was a Tyndale Bible that was the first Bible to get into people's hands. Uh, and, then, and then the Bible began to, to spread like wildfire, okay? People started to get a hold of the Word of God. And, and, and this wonderful just uh, season in the church started to take place called the Reformation. It's called the Reformation. People had no understanding of this term grace for a thousand years in the church. For a thousand years, it was all about this word work, meaning what can you do to earn God? What can you do to work your way to get God to accept you? For a thousand years, people believed this. And all of a sudden, there was this revolution that took place when the scripture in Ephesians 2 and 8 was first discovered in the year 1517, it was for, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no, so no one can boast. For we're his workmanship created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. Now, the scripture was powerful to people, and what, what took place is that they got, they got a hold of this term grace and started to work alongside of the grace of God, and it produced renaissance. And I just want to tell you that that same principle is, is the principle that we're going to dive into today, that when you work alongside of the grace of God on your life, you will produce renaissance. You will produce renaissance. I'm thinking of one of our board members right now who also happens to come to our church, Doug Smith. My man, Doug, we have known each other and we've been brothers for over 15 years. And I remember that Doug and I, we walked into Pastor Larry's office pretty much the same day to become interns together. And we, you know, we were both a little rough around the edges and had so much fun together during those times. And you know, many times of prayer and many times of worship together and many times of just, you know, just being together as brothers and hanging out. And I watched God begin to produce a renaissance inside of him. And that's what the grace of God is. But now Doug had this leaning, he always had a leaning toward leadership development, toward teaching people leadership principles so they can go into the workplace and make a huge difference. Now we're watching, Doug is leaning into the grace of God on his life, and now he has an organization called L3 that's impacting leaders all around Pittsburgh. When you have the grace of God on your life and you work hard along with that grace of God, it will produce renaissance in your life, okay? So here's the thing. If you want renaissance in your family, fathers, pastors of the home, you have a grace of God on your life to lead your family. Now, your work will lean into that, that grace and it will produce renaissance. It'll produce a revolution within your family, creativity. This is what we see taking place when we work alongside of the grace of God. But this argument remains in the church today. Uh, and, and you know what? 
scripturally in the book of James, verse 1, 22 and 25, it says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. He'll be blessed in his doing. Uh, Take a look at that principle, right? It's you working alongside of the grace of God equals blessing. So God's grace plus your hard work equals renaissance. You got to remember that. You have to remember that. God's grace plus your hard work equals renaissance. This is a principle that you could take back into work with you. That if I've got a grace on my life to be in this job and in this position and in this season, I'm going to lean into that grace and I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can. And it is going to produce renaissance. God is not afraid of blessing the work of your hands. But let me tell you something, you've got to work. God, notice these scriptures. I'm going to read you actually a couple scriptures today in in just a little bit. But notice that none of these scriptures say God's going to bless the seat of your pants. God's going to bless you as you're sitting. No, it says God's going to bless you in the work of your hands. God's always coming behind the work of your hands. You know, we serve a God who's not afraid to get dirty, to get his hands dirty. He's always working. He has been working. When he said to create the, the star, when he, when he spoke to crea- for creation, creation is still expanding today. He's always working. But God also has a principle of rest. And simply, we follow suit in that. You know, Jesus was a carpenter. He worked with his hands. He didn't just sit around reading the Old Testament all day, you know? You know, like when you get to heaven someday, you're still going to work. Like seriously, there's still going to be work for you in heaven. It's just going to be fulfilling work. You're going to look forward to it. But I don't know where we get this idea that there's no, there's not going to be any work in heaven. What do you think you're going to do? Just play a harp the whole time? You know, no way. There's work in heaven. In the beginning, in, in the book of Genesis, see, a lot of people believe that this thing called work came in whenever the fall came in. Because it says, you know, you'll work by the sweat of your brow when, after the fall. But no, God gave Adam a job. Before he gave him a woman, some of you need to just pay attention to that one, okay? Remember that. God gave Adam a job before he gave him a wife. Let let me just stop. Let me just stop. I know. I know. Come on. You're looking for a wife. You'd better be working, okay? Girlies, don't be dating him if he hasn't had a job yet, okay? Come on. This is a good principle. Okay, Pastor Zach's done. I'm, I'm done here. But look, This idea, are you saved by grace alone or works alone, continue to go into the church. And I just need to lean into this before we get into the next part, okay? In James 2, 20, this this scripture could be confusing. And I'm not afraid to tackle some some confusing scriptures every once in a while. I think this can really help you. Again, this is one of the most theologically uh, foundational aspects that you need to know, that I need to know within our walk with God. Am, Am I saved by grace or by works? See, I remember being a Catholic and I remember... Uh, thinking that if I didn't go to church one, one week, but I died that week, then I would, I would go to hell. Or if I, I committed a sin and I didn't go to con- confession that week and con- confess that sin, well, then I couldn't be in the presence of God. See, it was, it was upon my efforts in my mind. And, and, and man, there's so many different things that I love about my Catholic upbringing. Don't get me wrong. But I was convinced that it was my works that saved me, not Christ's work or grace that saves me, right? That saves me. And, and James 2 is, is actually a little bit of a confusing scripture. So look at this in James 2, verse 20 through 26. It says, do you, want to be, do you want to be shown, foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac at the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works. Understand, underline that, highlight that. Faith was active along with his works. And faith was completed by his works. There's the theological understanding that you need. Faith is active along with his works. And faith was completed by his works. So faith will actually produce your doing. Right faith produces right doing. Okay? So good. He was called a friend of God. He says, you see, a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, 
Was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So here is the theological question. Am I saved by faith alone or by my works? Am I saved by my faith or by my works? What the Apostle Paul and, what the, and, and James the Apostle, what they, what they bring together here is that your faith will produce good works. Your faith will produce good works, okay? Uh, genuine faith, remember this and write this down. This is the key principle for today. Genuine faith produces good works. Genuine faith always produces good works. Our oldest son this past week had a dream Actually, this dream started in our VBS last year. He came to us after a time where we just gave the kids some reflective time and told them to draw out something that they felt God might be speaking to them. And he came to us and said that he wanted to raise $500 for charity. Well, that dream hasn't left him in a year. And uh, this past week, he kind of came to us and he was like, hey, I really want to raise $500 for charity. And we came behind that dream. Uh, right now, as, uh, as, I, as I speak, we have, we've raised over $1,000 for three different charities, five different charities, actually, that we're going to be doing. See, you know, that, that's awesome, right? That's really cool. But, you know, as a dad, I kind of look at him and I'm like, is faith really producing in him? Like, is what we're doing around our dinner table, come on, pastors of the home, come on, dads at the home, pay attention, you got this. Is, is when we pray around the dinner table really impacting him? Is when we, we read him a scripture at night or pray over him and, and have these side put my arm around him and have these like side talks with him and share the word of God with him. Is it really working? When he produced good works, that was a key indicator that that faith is active and that faith is alive in him. He's fired up about it. I'm actually relieved because his good faith, his good works are actually showing me that his faith is real, you know? Uh, James is really hard on people who say they have faith, but their lives don't, don't produce anything. He's really hard on people. You know, uh, I'm just going to speak to something real quick. This is called a, a character issue. It's when you say you have faith, but your actions don't actually line up with it. It's a character issue. Uh, in, in Greece, this word, uh, the word hypocrite, we have the word hypocrite. It comes from the word hypokritos in, in Greek, hypokritos. The hypokritos was an actor who would put on different masks and play someone very differently in a play. He'd play, you know, three or four different parts. One scene would go by, he'd have a mask on and he'd play that part. Then he'd go back behind the scenes and he'd come back out with another mask on and he'd play someone else. That was the hypocritos, the man who was different in different scenes, okay? Uh, the word character, integrity comes from the word integer. This is, so this is becoming a whole person. God didn't create you to have different slices of pie for each room that you walk into. And this is what James is actually saying. He's like, if you are who you say you are, what you do is going to back what you say. What you do is going to back what you say. So remember this, genuine faith produces good works. Man, I'm almost done. This is going to be good. Remember this, genuine faith produces hard work. Just as genuine faith produces good works, genuine faith produces hard work. How many of you know you want? God wants you to work hard. God wants you to work hard. He doesn't want you to kill yourself. He doesn't want you to overburden yourself but he wants you to work hard. And you are actually created to work. It seems like to me, and I, I've got a lot of friends who are uh, retiring right now, and I, I even told this to my dad. I said, Dad, you know, when you retire, don't, don't sit around. Now, my dad is like one of the hardest working men I've ever met in my life. There's no way he's just gonna be sitting around. But it seems like when you start to sit around, that's when things start to stop in your body, you know? You were made to work, you were made to move, you were created that way. Uh, genuine faith produces hard work. Now, my grandfather was like one of the best men I've ever known. He was one of my very best friends. When uh, I would go to breakfast with him every Friday, we would spend so much time together, and he really opened up to me and would tell me the truth. He would really tell me what he thought. Well, one day I go over to his house, and I was with my mom, and his hearing aids were on like a little, a little paper plate, and they were like charred or melted a little bit, and they looked like they were just like smashed. And I was like, Pat, what happened to your, what happened to your hearing aids? Uh, and he said, I accidentally put them in the microwave. My mom was standing there. But he, I said, how'd you put those in the microwave? And my mom was in the other room. He said, don't tell your mom. He said, you know, these things were whistling so bad, they wouldn't work. 
I pulled him out. I got so mad. I hit him with a hammer three times. I put him in the microwave for 10 minutes. <laughs> you, you just killed something because it didn't work, right? My grandfather, he hated things that didn't work. He hated things that didn't work. And I find myself sometimes, I don't know how many of you can't stand when you have something that doesn't work. And for me, it's technology. If technology doesn't work, I'm like, I bought you to do one thing to work, right? I can't stand when it doesn't work. God loves you even if you don't work, but he's saying, come on, you better get to work. You better have a good work ethic. My grandfather taught me a really, really good principle of hard work. And, and man, I don't know about you, but I want my kids to understand the principle of hard work. I wanna model for them hard work. And one of the best things that we've done as a family is we said the Blair family works hard six days a week and we rest hard one day a week. We're gonna have one day a week where we, where we solve zero problems. And this principle actually fuels us. I'm gonna give you a little bit of, of wisdom that I found just over the last six months that you cannot have meaningful rest without hard work. And you can't have, you can't continue in hard work without having meaningful rest. We found this principle to be true in our family. The other night, I took my oldest son down, and you know he he wants to um, he wants to ride bikes and stuff like that. So I'm teaching him bike mechanics. He's 10 years old. You can change a tire. You can change the tube on your tire. Let's go. I'm gonna I'm gonna walk you through these principles. But I don't want everything handed to him. Now listen, I, you know I, I got a, I got a little something in the back of my mind here, and I hope this comes out right. You know I, I want to teach my kids to believe God. I want to teach my kids to know that they can, they, they, can, they can walk in and expect the blessing of God in their life. But you know what I want them to, to learn? I want them to learn hard work because the, hard, the, the road of hard work, there's a process that God is gonna teach them something. You know, I, I think a lot of times if we, we, we learn in, in, in churches to, you know, to walk around the car and to, to, you know, to believe God over the car and just be like, that's my car in Jesus' name and that's my house in Jesus' name. You hear that, th that, that theology. And, you know, the Bible actually says that, there is, there's power in your words, that there's power in, in your confession. He says, Jesus said, if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea, it'll be done if you believe, right? It's like, whoa. So a, a, a faith confession moves mountains. But I'll tell you what happens. I'll tell you what. Sometimes we teach this faith confession without the principle of hard work. And I'm just wondering if it's doing any good. I want my kids to know that they can believe God for anything. I want my church family to know that you can believe God for anything, that you can believe God to get out of the circumstance that you're in. You can hold on to God to, to prosper you and to bless, but he's gonna bless the work of your hands. He's not gonna bless you as you're sitting on the couch. He might, he might bless you. He can only bless you so much when you're sitting on the couch, okay? You've got to get up and you've got to do something. And, and, you know, it, God doesn't want you to live from miracle to miracle, from like, when's this check going to come in? God has godly ideas for you. He's got work for you, and he wants to prosper you in this. Read a couple of scriptures with this. Ephesians 4, 28. It says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. You know, this idea of God, you know, is against prospering people. I don't understand it because God wants to prosper people, but he wants to prosper people with a purpose. He wants you to live your life to the fullest. And he doesn't want, God's not against, God's not against prospering you. He is against greed. He is against selfishness. He is against self-centeredness. But God is not against prospering you. And I'll tell you what, I see more, more scriptures of God blessing the works of your hands, then I see him wanting you to be in the state that you're currently in. God is a God who continually advances things. He continually moves things forward. And listen, I, I even believe that you're, you might be watching right now and you might have a little bit of a dream in your heart, like right in front of you, and you're like, how in the world is God gonna advance it? You just start moving. Do you never remember the scripture uh, in, in the book of Psalms where it says that your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path? Well, if you have a lamp, on, to your feet, you're only lighting one step at a time. Well, what's God gonna do? Just start stepping. Just, got, just start stepping. Look at some of these scriptures. I love this. It says in Proverbs 13 and verse four, it says, lazy people want much but get little. But those who hard, work hard will prosper. Your hard work will bring you a prosperity that glorifies God. It's actually the key to building his kingdom, right? God wants to prosper the work of your hands. I want to say work. Some of you are thinking work, man. You spend 155,000 hours of your life 
at work. That's essentially a quarter of your life, if I'm doing the math right. Two-thirds of people say, man, if I could get a new job, I definitely would. <laughs> I want to read you a couple of scriptures to show you and to tell you, like, I hope this drills into your heart that God wants to prosper the work of your hands. That when you go back to work, you don't have to go back to work alone. And that if you're looking for a job right now, that God has a job for you and his grace is gonna come alongside of your hard work and effort. And I just believe with all my heart that you working your tail off in a, God, in a godly manner is actually gonna give more glory to God than you might even realize. Psalm 1, verse 1 through 3, I would love for you just to make these confessions in your, over your life. Psalm 1, 1 through 3, it says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Look at this, come on. Whatever he does prospers. Whatever he does prospers. God wants to move you forward, but it's time for you to get a hold of the work he has for you and work alongside of his grace. Genesis 39 and verse three, it says, now his master talking about Joseph saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. First Kings 2, 3, it says, and observe what the Lord your God requires, walk in his ways and keep his decrees and commands his laws and requirements as written in the law of Moses so that you may prosper in all you sit. No, you may, be, you may prosper in all your wishing. No, that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go, wherever you go. Deuteronomy 12 and verse seven, it says, Though there also you and your household shall eat before the Lord and rejoice in all your undertakings in which the Lord your God has blessed you. See, God wants to bless the work of your hands. I'll give you one more. In Deuteronomy 29, verse 9, it says, So keep the words of his covenant and do them, so that you may prosper in all that you do. Uh, I had this, this great friend named Keith, and this has been coming up in my heart week in and week out. And you know what? Sometimes if I told this story a couple weeks ago, I just feel in my heart to keep on telling the story. I, I don't know what it is. There's this like, maybe I should grit this out or, or maybe I shouldn't, I don't know. But I think there might, you know what? It, I, I feel like maybe the Lord is, is sharing with me even right now, like, hey, you know, if I, if, if I tell you to share it multiple times, share it multiple times because they didn't get it yet. <laughs> so I'm just gonna lean into that. If you've heard this story before, listen again, okay? But man, my friend Keith, he was a really great rider. We were uh, riding from Pittsburgh to DC on a bike and like a pedal bike, yeah, right? So 250 miles, five days, I think it was, it was right around there, it was, you know, somewhere around there. And the guys kept on talking about this guy named Keith. He said, man, Keith can really ride. Keith is a great rider. He really knows how to grind it out. That's what they said, he really knows how to grind it out. And I was like, man, what's it mean to grind it out? I was like, hey, Keith, what, what, what's it mean to grind it out? He's like, Zach, you gotta push through the pain. And I was like, oh, push through the pain. Well, that makes sense. I was like, okay. I was like, well, can you teach me how to grind it out? And Keith looked at me, he's like, yeah, come on, let's go. We were going at about an average of like 12 miles an hour. Keith pushes us up to like 18 to 20 miles an hour. We had six hours of bike riding that day, okay? That was like crazy, six hours maybe of bike riding at like 10 miles an hour, I don't know. But that's crazy, right? He bumped us up to like 20 miles an hour. We got the, we got to the place, he, he looked at me and he said this, and I'll never forget, he said to me, Zach, there's always more in you than you think there is. And you're always stronger than, the, than you think you are. You're always stronger than you think you are. I mean, today I want you to know, okay? All right, you, might, you might not have a job. You might be looking for your next job. You might be a part of the two thirds who are like, man, I, I, wish that I, could, I wish that I could get another job. I just want you to know that when you work alongside of the grace of God, it's gonna produce renaissance in your life. You need to know this, that there's always more in you than you think there is. And you're always stronger than you think you are. Well, we're gonna take a time, we're gonna take a moment. Ellie's prepared a song for us, just a simple hymn. I just wanna read a couple of these scriptures over and we're just gonna reflect in just a minute, have just a reflective time 
I just want you to close your eyes right where you are. Come on, right where you are. Just take a big breath in. And let's pray. God, I just thank you so much for everybody a part of Hill City Church. I thank you that, Lord, you bless the work of our hands, that it's not by works that we're saved, but it's by grace that we're saved through faith. So God, I pray for anybody who's watching today who doesn't know you. Lord, I pray that you reveal yourself to them. This is in my heart to just share with you, just step out of prayer for a second, but if you don't know Christ, man, he died for you. This isn't a story that he made up. It's some people made up in order to, to prosper or whatever. I mean, it doesn't even make sense. All the people who were eyewitnesses of Jesus ended up giving their lives over for that cause, right? They believed with all of their heart that Jesus was who he said he was. And I think that there are some people out here, maybe some Catholics like I talked about before, who are watching this right now, and you believe with all your heart that Jesus was who he said he was. But I'll tell you what, you know, you might be trusting in your works today. You might be trusting in your good works and you might be at the place where you hope that someday God is gonna accept you because of what you've done. Well, let me tell you something. God doesn't accept you because of what you've done. He accepts you because of what he's done. This is the grace of God. And so if you don't know Christ, pray with me right now. Just repeat after me and mean these words from your heart. Say, Father God, I come to you in Jesus' name, and I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. He died on the cross for me, and God, you raised him to life. God, make me a child of God. Jesus, you're my Savior and Lord, and I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, as we close today, Ellie has one song. I'm gonna read some scriptures over you. Just sit right where you are. Just go ahead and close your eyes. Just take a big breath in. Let this moment be super reflective for you. Psalm 1, verse 1 through 3. It says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. Come on, meditate day and night on his word. Put his word in your heart. Be that tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Come on, it's time to plant yourself. It's time to plant yourself by the river of Christ. Whatever you do prospers. Wake up in the morning and put the word, hide the word of God in your heart. In Genesis 39 and verse three, it says, now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. Come on, let me just pray a prayer over you that all you do is gonna prosper. So God, I just bless every person listening right now and I thank you in Jesus' name that you prosper all the work of their hand. Lord, we just sit and we just rest as a song ministers to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When peace I go Oh
say